Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to the first session of IA Bioenergy e-workshop Contribution of Sustainable Biomass and Bioenergy in Industry Transition Towards a Circular Economy. This first session will be focused on biomass for medium and high temperature heat in industry. The session will be chaired by Jim Speth, U.S. Department of Energy and Mark Brown from the University of Sunshine Coast, Australia. The session will be joined by David Marshall from ADEM, France, Paolo Frank from the International Energy Agency, Ole Olsen from the Stockholm Environmental Institute, Jap Kopian uh, from uh, Pro Biomass of uh, Netherlands, Min Hiep Guyen from Nestlé, and Richard Orsi from SFI Marai Center for Energy, Climate and Marine from Ireland. Um, during the uh, workshop, um, you will have the possibility to drop questions Q uh, using the Q&A tab that you can find at the bottom of your screen. Please um, use just this tab and not the chat ones uh, for questions. Um, during the um, workshop, we will also have a Slido session chaired by Luke Bellmans, Technical Coordinator of IA Bioenergy. Um, the session is uh, recorded and you will find the recording and the presentations of today's session on IA Bioenergy website from tomorrow on. So I uh, give the floor to Jim Speth now and um, enjoy the workshop. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much and welcome all. Thanks for joining us to this first of a set of three different uh, sessions on this workshop, the contribution of sustainable biomass and bioenergy in, in industry transitions toward a circular economy. It's my pleasure to moderate this first workshop along with Mark Brown. I'd like to quickly turn it over to Mark to say hello and uh, a late good evening from Australia, Mark. Hello everybody. Um, as noted, I'm at the University of the Sunshine Coast in Australia. Uh, I head up the Forest Industry Research Center at the university and also chair or task leader for the task on biomass supply within IA Bioenergy. I'm looking forward to the discussion today and I'll be watching the question and answer sections throughout the presentations and getting some key questions across to the presenters after each session. Thank you very much, Mark. And now I'd like to introduce the technical coordinator for the IEA Bioenergy, Mr. Luke Pelkmans. And Luke will be helping us in the background with running the Slido workshops and introduce us to Slido. So Luke, please. Okay, thank you, Jim. I'm uh, first going to share my screen. I hope everybody can see it. Uh, so my name is Luke Falkmans. I'm a technical coordinator of IA Bioenergy and I was also responsible for uh, um, for the program of this workshop, which um, as, as uh, some of you have seen was intended to be in Lyon in France, but uh, circumstances have actually forced us to do this online. I think uh, it's an experiment also for us uh, to see how we can uh, do this and also how we can have a good interaction with uh, with the people uh, that are following the webinar. Um, just introducing you to Slido. So you see on the screen here that uh, you can join uh, the Slido polls if you go to slido.com, uh, either on your laptop uh, in parallel, either you can do it on your uh, uh, your mobile phone. So uh, just, uh, just go to slido.com um, and enter P988. Uh, and then it's uh, you have access to the poll, which uh, usually usually works pretty uh, pretty efficiently. So I'll give you a little bit of time to to go there. So slido.com and then p nine eight eight, and you will see immediately a question which is open. Uh, and here on the screen we see immediately also what what you have entered. So you see the statistics uh, going quite fast. We're already twenty three people, twenty six. Um, and the first question that we want to pose here is, is a little bit to get to know you. So uh, what sector do you work in? So, so what kind of audience are we talking to here? Uh, do we have a good mix of people? 
uh, in the background uh, in terms of, of the learnings of, uh, of uh, what's presented here and what's being discussed. So you see it evolving. Um, we will have um, four multiple choice polls uh, after a few of the presentations here. And then at the end, um, you'll notice we'll have a, a panel discussion, a moderated Q&A. And the central questions that we have for the moderated Q&A will also be, uh, be in the Slido. So you can also give your opinion on, uh, on these questions. There will be three questions um, in, this, uh, in this session. Uh, just to remind also, if you have specific questions towards the speakers or, or the presentations, it is best to, uh, to put these in the Q&A in the Zoom. Uh, so the slide was more to get your opinion on certain questions and, and certain polls. So I see that we're already reaching uh, about 100 and the majority, like 60% at the moment, uh, is, is mainly from, uh, from research institutes. I'll let this poll open uh, so far until we go to the next poll. So uh, I will just uh, stop, sc stop uh, screen sharing, but it remains open so you can still enter your input. And then when we go to the next one, um, Jim will also mention that I think uh, uh, for the next poll, and then we go to another question. So thanks already for input. I see many people have also entered and I will stop sharing now and then we can go to the uh, presentations. Thank you. Luke, thank you very much. Looks like everyone is, or a lot of people are quite comfortable with Slido. So that's great. We're going to have a series of six speakers today from a wide variety of experts in this area, a very rich panel, and then they will be the panelists to answer the Q&A afterwards, and we welcome your questions. So it's a two-hour session overall, and now I'd like to introduce the first speaker. So the first speaker is Mr. David Markal, who is the Deputy Executive Director for Expertise and Programs in ADEM which is the French Agency for Ecological Transition. So David, please take it away. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Jim. Um, just share my screen. I think it should be OK now. So yes, it's good. Okay, so I work in the French Environment uh, Agency uh, or, or the French Agency for the Ecological Transition, the, the ADEM, and I'd like to present you some um, some information about the French policy for uh, for biomass. Uh, so, as you can see on this slide, yes, this one, uh, the French uh, framework. The French framework for uh, for uh, energy uh, has multiple objectives. Just like to focus on three of these. The first one is uh, the objective of carbon neutrality by 2050 uh, on the first line. Um, the second one is another objective about final energy consum consumption. We we have the objective to decrease by a half the final en energy consumption um, in comparison with 2012. And we also have an important objective about heat consumption, renewable heat consumption, which is a new one uh, to increase uh, renewable heat consumption uh, by 40 to 60% compared to 2007. And this is part of uh, a package of a new, uh, of new objective which is called uh, PPE in France. The PPE is some kind of a 10 years energy plan. Um, and in this 10 years energy plan, uh, there are several objectives for biomass. Uh, the first one is uh, an objective about heat and cold production from biomass. And the, the, the objective is to increase by 36% uh, this production in 2028 compared to 2016. We have also objective about biofuels and especially advanced biofuels. And uh, at the end of our objectives for biogas, uh, they are really important. Uh, the objective is to increase uh, mainly for biogas injection, uh, the production from four terawatt hour in 2017 to around 30 terawatt hours. 
uh, note that there are no, no specific support scheme for THP or combined and heat production. There, there is no specific support scheme for co-production of uh, power and, and heat. As for biomass energy, uh, in France, uh, biomass is the first renewable energy in France. Uh, and uh, this, is, this will be mainly used to produce heat. Uh, you have on this uh, graph uh, the, the heat production objectives in orange for domestic heat and in green for industrials and district heating. Uh, you can see that the main uh, increase concerns uh, the, the green part of the graph, uh, so industry and collective sectors uh, with a very strong increase. And the main tool, the, the, the main policy tool is uh, called the heat fund that I will present later on. And there's also uh, a lower uh, a reduced uh, value added tax for this heat. As for the orange part, uh, the domestic heat, uh, the challenge is to maintain the current production level by increasing the number of equip equipment. Uh, and each equipment, each wood stove will have a more efficient uh, yield. So uh, the, the, the global level is, re remains the same. So um, let's talk about the heat fund, uh, the heat fund, uh, what is it? This is a tool implemented by, by the ADEM since uh, 2009. Um, it gives subsidy uh, to, uh, to renewable energy for heat production. So biomass, geothermal energy, heat pumps, solar thermal, and also recovery energy, especially waste heat from industry and waste. And uh, this uh, fund also aims at uh, funding district heating. Uh, district heating, yes. So we helped uh, around 5,000 projects uh, since uh, 2009 with more than, more than 2 billion euro subsidies in 10 years. And those subsidies are either custom made subsidies for larger projects or uh, fixed subsidy in a euro per megawatt hour for smaller projects. This is quite efficient because the average public cost is only of four euro per megawatt hour, which is really uh, far lower than uh, the electricity, for example, support scheme uh, for uh, wind or, uh, or PV. And we have around uh, 200 million euros to uh, free 150 million euros in 2020 of subsidies. So, uh, what are uh, the what is the focus on industry? As for industry, uh, you can see on this graph the main sectors that are uh, funded. So you can see that there are uh, dairy products, there are uh, agri food industry, there are um, building material industry, wood industry and paper making, these are the main sectors uh, for the heat fund uh, on industry. And uh, I'd like to present this example. Uh, this is just one example uh, among the more, via, more than 5,000 um, projects, uh, because I know that, uh, I know that you, you like uh, French cheese. Uh, so this is a, a French cheese maker, French cheese industry, Belle. Uh, which has uh, installed uh, a biomass production of uh, 55 gigawatt hour. And uh, we, uh, we gave uh, funding about uh, around 50% of the cost. In 2020, there is a new plan. Uh, France Relance is, a, is the name of the French recovery plan with a time frame between 2020 to 2022, with more than 2 billion euros, especially for in the industry decarbonization. And uh, with this uh, more than 1 billion euro for the industry decarbonization, there, there is uh, a, a special support for action towards energy effic efficiency. First, and also a new 
way to to to, to fund uh, the biomass project uh, with an OPEX subsidy. This is new because uh, the, the, the heat fund um, gave uh, um, gave only capex subsidies, and now we will be able to also uh, fund the project with an opex subsidy. And this opex subsidy uh, aims is to secure the financial package uh, by taking into account the gas price. Um, in addition to those uh, to those deployment support scheme, uh, we also have a, a support scheme for innovation and a research and development project. So, depending on the, the technology readiness level, you, you, we we may help uh, PhD thesis research project, but also a wider scale innovation demonstrators. Uh, so, the investment for the future is a special uh, way to, to, to help uh, big demonstrators. Uh, the, the current call, uh, for example, is on bioeconomy and environment, and uh, it, uh, it um, has several axes, um, eco-efficient agriculture and agri-food industries, mobilization of biomass and production of new biomass, bio-based materials and chemistry, and renewable energy. So this is especially for uh, industrial demonstrators of innovation projects. One example of this uh, kind of project is a, um, um, a project from uh, Comte Air, which is a French industry uh, that, uh, that makes um, a boiler, industrial boilers, and uh, the project Aimed, aimed at um, uh, developing a new treatment system for uh, decreasing uh, the nitrogen oxides. Um, so this is a, a, a project that has been funded by, by the ADEM. To sum up uh, the, the French policy framework for, uh, for biomass, I could see that uh, we have um, a, a, a policy framework with two levels. The first one is uh, quantitative and planified targets for 2028 with a 10 years uh, energy plan. And the second one is that we have adapted financial support policies um, with a main, uh, main focus on heat production. This is really important in France now. The, uh, the biomass has to be used especially for heat production um, we have uh, dedicated schemes for the industry sectors. We've existing existing support policy with capex support, and uh, uh, in 2021, a new uh, support with opex support to to accelerate and to compensate for the the, the low gas prices. And we also have other uh, other support for innovation, uh, especially for of the bioeconomy uh, sectors, such as uh, chemistry and the bio-based sustainable chemistry. Thank you. David, thank you very much for your presentation and timeliness. We have a few questions, and I'll just take the first one quick. And uh, David, I don't know if you have the Q&A up, but it says, the question is, what are the important criteria to get white certificates in biomass project or research? Uh, the, the, white, the, the, the white certificates are only used for uh, uh, domestic projects, but also for, 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 for biomass heat projects. And the, the main uh, criteria is to have a high, lead, uh, high uh, yield or high uh, efficiency, higher than the, um, the, the, the average uh, on the market. So the, the white certificate compensate for the difference of uh, energy efficiency. Thank you, David, very much. So we will uh, have more time with David in the moderated section. Thank you, David. We'll now go to our next speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce Paula Franco, who many of you probably know well, at least virtually. Paula is the head of the Renewable Energy Division at the IEA, which she joined in 2007. He leads the IA's work on renewable energy, 
provided policy advice in the areas of technology, markets, and systems integration. He's been a great friend to the technology collaboration program. We exist under the auspices and the organization under the IA Secretariat, and uh, we really appreciate all of his support and working with Paulo and the IEA uh, Secretariat. So, Paulo, if I could turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, and uh, thank you for the kind words. And please uh, let me say immediately that this pleasure is uh, reciprocal. We also love to work with the TCP a lot, and we learn a lot from you. Now, my um, uh, role today is to show, if I manage, to share my screen with you. Let, let's see. Let's see now. Pop, 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 pop. Where has the screen? Well, let me show, let me do this. Okay. And hopefully, can you see my slide? Can you confirm that you can see my slide yes. correctly? Yes, the Paul, problem you is put that it in the I... presentation mode. Uh, yes, I'm trying. Okay, now, now it should, mm -hmm. it should be working, right? <clears throat> okay, Perfect. so uh, in my minutes of presentation, I would like to put the role of biomass in industry and, of course, for the carbonizing industry in the IEA SDS sustainable development scenario. So look at the broader context and then frame the discussion for other more detailed um, interventions. Now, in general, still today, when we speak about uh, renewables, uh, most of the attention still goes to the electricity part and in particular rightly so to the immense progress of solar and wind but if you then uh, show uh, if you see uh, how much of the uh, contribution to uh, decarbonization towards net zero emissions in up starting from 2050 then you immediately see that actually decarbonizing just the power sector is by far not enough it only makes one third of the job. So even if we do all solar, all wind, all bioelectricity, all uh, whatever uh, clean electricity technology we can uh, invent, this will not do the job. And uh, that's obviously the main reason for that in the yellow part in this graph is precisely industry and then also transport and buildings, the so-called hard to abate uh, sectors. Now, <clears throat> Here comes the solution. The solution, first of all, is not a single technology and not even a family of technologies, but a large portfolio of clean energy technologies is needed in, in, in order to bring full decarbonization. However, within that family, uh, bioenergy brings a notable contribution to emission reduction and part of it is when combined with carbon capture use and storage leading to an incredible amount of one-fifth of annual emission uh, reductions um, through the uh, 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 through the whole uh, period which is really uh, which I need to repeat so bioenergy and including it with a combination of carbon capture use and storage could lead to one fifth of total annual emission reduction uh, by 2070. Now, coming to the core of this session, which is industry, um, it's very clear that decarbonizing heavy industry is actually the most difficult uh, challenge in these transitions, um, not only in absolute amount, uh, but also uh, towards the end of the period. And actually from our graph, you can see that the world hardly manages to, and actually does not manage uh, to entirely um, reduce the emissions, which means that those emissions needs to be compensated by negative emissions in other sector, notably the power sector uh, after 2050. Now, uh, Already today, uh, the heavy industry emissions are responsible for the majority of the emissions, but uh, more in the long term in the future, they account to almost 80% um, of the total remaining emissions as less energy intensive industries approach more easily uh, full uh, decarbonization. So that's the heart of the problem. And this is why uh, your uh, session in, is indeed very, very timely and very appropriate. Now. 
um, in this graph, you can appreciate in terms of final energy demand, the growth and the contribution of bioenergy, it's the hell green, um, light green uh, part in the graphs, in the total industry and in the heavy industries. And uh, no surprise, you can say, you can see that one of the major contribution to decarbonization is electricity. Uh, bioenergy plays a very important role, although more in uh, um, less heavy industry, um, but, and uh, what is of course not shown here because um, this is just primary energy, uh, over the three quarters of the remaining CO2 emissions must be captured and permanently stored uh, through uh, CCUS. So important contribution of bioenergy in total industry, um, a little bit trickier in the heavy industry, and but I would like to give now an example where the contribution of bioenergy is particularly interesting, and this is the chemical uh, sector. Now, if you look at the left, where you see the decarbonization uh, options, one part to start with, it comes from material efficiency, which is important, and uh, importantly, another theme of your conference on the uh, circular economy. Then, electrification, hydrogen, and again, bioenergy and other renewables, and then a big chunk, uh, as I said, from CCUS. Now, why is that? Indeed, because CCUS and electrolytic hydrogen are very important in the upstream part of the chemical sector, while by energy and electrification becomes more important to low to medium temperature process heat and feedstock in, in the downstream part. On the right, you can see the final energy consumption and indeed uh, uh, now the contribution is, of course, uh, by energy gives an important contribution, but in terms of relative increase in this sector, this is immense for the by energy uh, sector and therefore it's an important um, challenge. Now, uh, while I'm, I was saying before that bioenergy contributes to massive CO2 emission reductions, really uh, a very, very important part on one fifth of the total CO2 reductions, it is important at the same time to look at the competing uses of biomass itself. Because of course, there is only one earth and one sustainable feedstock available. They're not uh, different options and to some extent, uh, different um, uses of uh, biomass needs to be compared, to be compared among themselves and to be compared also taking into account what is the competition from other fossil fuels or clean um, energy options. Now here you can see that industry indeed plays a major role, although the big chunk comes actually with power uh, with and uh, without uh, CCS, but industry plays an important role. Now, I wish to continue to emphasize uh, this because the competing uses and the sustainability must always be considered. I can only repeat a thousand times that my energy can and must be sustainable in order to contribute to the low carbon, to the clean energy transitions. In the graph on the left, please take into account that the dark green is uh, traditional use of biomass in buildings, in particular in developing countries that we want to phase out as soon as possible. So overall, uh, between uh, now and 2050, the use of uh, modern uh, bioenergy needs to triple, which is an immense uh, opportunity, but of course also a challenge uh, for the sector. Now, on the right, you can see that the industry, using industry in final energy is a big, big increase. Although, of course, as no surprise, there are important other increases in uh, transport uh, uh, final energy as well. And, of course, in uh, buildings, the numbers are, um, they are shown in uh, shares. Uh, what is important to note is A, the need to supply uh, sustainable, um, mobilizing, sorry, uh, sustainable supply chains to untap uh, the unlocked potential of using uh, sustainable feedstocks like uh, waste and residue as much as possible. And remind that the use of energy crops is possible, but needs to be very, very careful assessed 
in terms of the overall amount of sustainable uh, bioenergy feedstock um, uh, available. Uh, we know, of course, that there are very uh, different uh, estimates in the world <clears throat> between how much the sustainable feedstock is. The IA has one, um, op let's say, uh, vision, which is around 150 exajoule. Uh, per year, uh, but there are others um, uh, on, on both sides, uh, both uh, more conservative and much more optimistic. Uh, to conclude, uh, four points. Uh, first of all, to understand that the full decarbonization of the energy system, and in particular of the hard to abate uh, sector, requires not one technology, not one family of technologies, but a large portfolio of uh, new innovative technologies that are needed to achieve the targets. And to do that, a particular attention uh, needs to be put on policy toolkits that foster technologies at different maturity stage. I didn't enter too much into that, but of course, I'm happy to welcome any questions on this. Renewables. Renewables role in a clean world is much stronger in terms of primary energy it more than quadruples by 2070 and reaching almost two thirds of the total and bioenergy itself triples becoming the second largest uh, supply source in primary terms after solar. Um, bioenergy uh, can play a key role as I think I hope uh, I showed for decarbonizing industry, uh, a number of challenges needs to be carefully considering, uh, considered, including competing users, sustainability of feedstocks, and uh, uh, mobilizing uh, supply chains. Now, uh, my last point is precisely on this sustainability. Uh, we still have a problem in transforming these positive externalities into money. We still continue very often to compare uh, things in um, dollars per megawatt hour of energy. Uh, the sustainability of bioenergy and other clean energy options must be measured and rewarded. And this helps compensating the cost gap with fossil fuels, which is there, which is even more there today in a moment of uh, low oil prices. Um, and which, of course, it's another challenge in the immediate uh, future for the uh, sector. I would stop it here. I thank you very much uh, for uh, your attention and I welcome um, any questions if there are. Thank you very much. Paolo, thank you very much. And I just want to uh, affirm that sustainability is viewed by all of us in the sector as the key and most important uh, <clears throat> fundamental operating principle. It is also a challenge, but absolutely fundamental for biomass to be used in the growth going forward. And thank you so much for laying out these scenarios. You've presented the challenge and opportunities very well. There are many questions, but I think I'll have just one, uh, give you just one at this point and save others for later. And that is the question of, despite the shutdown and lockdown of the world due to the COVID, why are the CO2 emissions increasing globally in the present scenario? if that is the case? Well, um, I mean, we need to distinct the, 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 the scenarios that I showed go up to 2070, eh, which is quite far in the future. Um, I, we need to distinguish the very, the short term and the medium and the long term. Now in the short term, it is true that in this year, um, the CO2 emissions will be uh, dramatically lower or significantly lower than last year. It's a minus 8%, which brings back the, the, the world to almost 10 years ago. Uh, but um, just this morning, we were discussing on an, in an internal meeting, look at what is happening in China. Uh, China was the first hit by the virus, but the first uh, to have a uh, strong lockdown and put the virus under control. It has a strong economic recovery right now, a big increase of emission of electricity demand, almost, well, predominantly uh, um, supplied by coal, and therefore uh, the uh, 
the, the, the emissions are going up again. This is the risk for the whole world that this could happen in next year if there are not policy, clear policy interventions and green recovery uh, measures um, as the one, for instance, uh, proposed by Europe. I wish also to remind that 10 years ago when we had the financial crisis, there was a CO2 emission reduction, a much smaller one than this one. And then the year after, emissions grew four times faster than before the crisis. So watch out, uh, even if we have a very good reason, no, even if the emissions are going down now for the wrong reasons, in, for the shutdown and the recession of the economies, uh, we need to do a strong collective policy effort to make, to avoid that uh, CO2 emission raise again in the coming years. In our long-term scenarios, what we take as a reference is the so-called uh, steps. So with the announced emission um, reduction, like in the pledges of the UN framework or other targets declared by countries. And unfortunately, this is not enough in our assessment to peak the emissions and drive them down, but rather they remain rather stable or they increase slightly over time. So we need much, much stronger effort to go to a sustainable development scenario and even more so to a net zero emission scenario by 2050. Thank you. Paolo, thank you very much. And we appreciate your perspective and the perspective of IEA is invaluable in helping to look at the large, uh, the global picture and the long-term perspectives. So hopefully you can stay with us for the moderated panel, Paolo, and we'll go on to our next speaker now. Yes, so Jim, it's Jim, my pleasure. Jim, yes. I'd like to have uh, a slide up. Oh, I'm sorry. Please go a ahead. We'd up. like to have a slide up question, and Luca, I'll let you introduce that. Thank okay, you. thank you. So I'll share my screen again. So uh, this was the previous poll that we had. So uh, the final number was actually 57% were, uh, of our participants or of the people who filled in the poll on Slido uh, were from research institutes and universities uh, and also some uh, uh, people from government, from industry, from consult consultancy and others. So, but, but there is an overwhelming majority from, uh, from the research side. Just for the people who uh, joined in after we launched the first poll, so uh, you will see on the side here, uh, please go to slido.com uh, and, and have uh, an enter P988, and then you'll also have access to our Slido polls. So let me close this one uh, at the moment, and we go to another one. Mm -hmm. I see some people have entered uh, some questions in the Q&A. It's best to leave the Q&A in the Zoom uh, function because the moderators have a good uh, view on those. They don't, they can't see them on Slido. So here is a next uh, poll on Slido. Uh, next question. Uh, what type of application do you think would be most interesting for the use of biomass in industry? And you can select uh, different options. I think you can uh, select uh, maximum three options. Uh, going from the, the heating of buildings to drying processes or producing process steam for industry uh, or producing very high heat levels, uh, making it input for chemicals or as a reductant for steel making. Uh, I see that uh, the numbers are going up. So if, if you haven't connected to Slido yet, so it's pretty easy uh, either take a parallel, parallel um, opening in, in slido.com, uh, either go to your, your smartphone and uh, enter slido.com with the uh, access code. Um, for now, the majority seems to be for input for chemicals, uh, process steam also, um, and very high heat levels, uh, less for heating of buildings and offices. Uh, so I think it's uh, pretty interesting outcomes also. Um, as with the previous, I will leave this open for the next uh, two presentations. So uh, you're still welcome to enter your input and then we'll see the, the final results uh, after when we go to the next poll. Okay, I will stop sharing.
Okay, well, thank you very much. And we'll explore the uses throughout this rest of this session. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Oli Olsen from the Swedish Energy Institute, headquartered in Pocket Stockholm. Oli has a particular focus on markets for wood-based bioenergy. He is currently the co-leader of the IEA Bio Bioenergy Task 40 on deployment of bio-based value chains, and he's coordinating an IEA Bioenergy Intertask project on BECS, on carbon capture and sequestration or utilization, which as we've just seen from Paulo and we all know, is seen as a key uh, opportunity and requirement for reaching some of these long-term emission reduction goals. So Ole, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Um, good to be with you all today. Um, my name is Ole Olsen with the Stockholm Environment Institute. And as uh, Jim said, I'm also the co-lead of IEA Bioenergy Task 40 looking into deployment of bio-based value chains. Um, in addition to leading this uh, InterTask project on uh, BioCCS or BEX, um, I'm also uh, leading a report that we are writing uh, as part of another InterTask project led by Jack Kopijan, who will hear from in a minute, about high temperature biomass heat in, in industries. So we just started working on there a report where we start mapping the sort of the policy market issues um, how these um, sync with technology options and so on, and see where are the actual barriers to, to getting towards um, implementation of um, biomass in, for industrial heat purposes. So I'll, I'll go through a little bit about the overview here. It's a very, it's a fairly broad topic, um, um, but uh, let's see how, uh, how far we get. Uh, and I'll, as I said, this is work in progress, so I'll be glad to get your input on, on some of the issues that I'll talk about. So I'll start with just uh, talking a little bit about industrial heat in, in a broad um, climate and energy context. Um, I'm a previous speaker, so obviously help a, a little bit there. Um, talking a little bit about what kind of industrial heat characteristics from a market and policy perspective, and then some of the policy options that uh, we have sort of mapped so far. But again, it's, it's early, early stages. So um, uh, an interesting thing when you start looking into industrial heat as a topic is that um, it's kind of difficult to quantify um, how much actually goes into um, how much energy actually goes into industrial heat, uh, and especially, I would say, if you try to categorize it in terms of different, uh, you know, heat uh, quality requirements, you can say, um, you can approximate it about approximately one fourth of total global energy demand is is industrial heat, um, and as Paolo talked about, that's a lot of that is in the sort of heavy, heavy. Uh, sectors in, in steel and in, in cement and petrochemicals and refining and so on. Um, the, there's um, been, um, we tried to sort of map uh, the sort of heat qualities that are out there where you would, and if you could see like the specific niches where you would um, have different uh, requirements. Uh, and one typical thing where that is, uh, way of structuring that is looking at temperatures. Um, so I've just sort of highlighted here um, approximately how you can view it, uh, that uh, about half of it is, is what, what's here called, here called high temperature heat. Um, what's high and low and medium, it's, it seems to be very, fairly arbitrary if you look across different sources, but this, just to give you an idea. Uh, whereas uh, low temperature and medium temperature heat is uh, one, one fourth to a third each. Uh, one thing that is pretty clear, though, uh, regardless of the uncertainties in categorization or statistics, is that um, similar to the global energy system, um, the heat, industrial heat is primarily supplied via, via fossil fuels, uh, with renewables only, only providing a minute share so far. So that, but that obviously needs to change uh, if we want to if we want to go to our net zero targets. Um, because uh, industry in total is uh, about 30% uh, of global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but here it's important again to distinguish that when you see that, for example, um, cement makes up so and so many percent of, of uh, global emissions or, or steel makes up so and so many percent of global emissions. It's not just about the process heat. If you look at, for example, in the cement sector, when you, when you produce Portland cement, uh, about one third of the, of the emissions typically come from, from the process heat and two thirds come from CO2 actually uh, emitted in, in the course of the production process as a byproduct. So there it's a little bit, you can get a little bit uh, uh, nerdy and, and uh, go into, well, is that, should that really be classified as heat emissions or but it's going on at very high temperatures and, and similar issues you have in, 
in, in steel production, primary steel production, where you, um, uh, in, in blast furnaces, when you make steel from electric iron ore, uh, similar situation there. Um, and it's important also to note again that it's a very diverse um, challenge here. So it, there are so many different applications with varying needs, not only in terms of temperatures, but also in terms of is the heat direct or indirect? And there you mean, but do you sort of, is this sort of flame from a combustion directly in contact with the things you're trying to heat or, or um, transfer uh, heat to? Or is it in the from indirect heat that would be through steam, for example? So this has, has quite important implications for the, the technology options that are available. Uh, and this also means that the, the, the sort of decarbonization options are also um, quite diverse. And, you, and I sort of group them here in, in three different categories. Um, you could say they are from um, the least amount of change to the system as a whole uh, to more and more change. Or you can see at CCUS could be seen as you basically sort of adding a car carbon capture uh, and utilization or storage part to an existing uh, fossil fuel system, um, all while keeping largely the same system uh, in place. Biomass uh, is a, probably a little bit more of a change in terms of uh, introducing the a new fuel, whereas electrification um, can be can be quite substantial changes and require a lot of system changes. Uh, and when I say electrification, I mean both are sort of direct electrification or indirect via hydrogen. So for example, if you produce uh, hydrogen via electrolysis uh, and use the hydrogen as the, as the medium by which you produce the actual heat in the process. So then if you look at um, what, what are then the sort of market, market based pathways to, to cost competitiveness if you want to go to a, a renewable heat option. Um, I'll, in the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about the policy options that might be needed. Um, in many cases, there are um, where there you actually see um, heat being renewable heat being implemented today. It's it's in form of sort of low hanging fruit where you already have on site residues that you can use um, uh, fairly easily. Although you might still be able to need some some investment support or conversion there as well. Um, you could also see in technology shifts um, that you could uh, if you scale up technologies and have an sort of an innovation support at the beginning, where you could get to um, cost competitiveness as you as the market scale up because it's often the case that the technologies are immature they are very expensive but when they grow and they you can sometimes get to a point where you're actually um, lower in cost than the fossil um, incumbent alternative even without um, sort of other external subsidies uh, this development we're seeing slowly happening and, and will probably happen in a couple of years with with electric vehicles for example Another interesting issue is that you, when you talk about uh, costs of industrial heat, you see that, well, you, yeah, yes, it might be more expensive if you look at the fuel cost um, uh, when you shift from um, uh, a fossil alternative to a renewable alternative. But if you take it, look at the whole supply chain, you might see that, well, if it, the fuel might be twice as costly, but what does this do to the cost of my chocolate bar that I might buy in the, in the store? It might be very minute and it might be possible to if you have a consumer push or a, a push from uh, brand owners or um, OEMs in the car industry, for example, that you might um, may be able to recoup that anyway. Uh, but that requires obviously supply chain coordination. So, uh, but obviously there's the, there's, there's the opportunity that these market uh, um, pathways might not be sufficient. Um, and then you look, have to look at need for policy. And interestingly, if you look at industrial uh, industrial sector at large, it's kind of dif different from um, the sort of uh, domestic heating or, or electricity because the product markets are often international or global. Uh, and that's why it's difficult to have um, uh, sort of, for example, uh, uh, a carbon price just within Europe that, that uh, affects uh, the industry sector because that means it becomes less competitive compared to other uh, parts of the world. And then there has been a system of free allocation uh, of, of emission uh, trading uh, rights to manufacturing uh, industries in the, in the EU ETS, for example. That's now in the process of slightly being phased out, uh, at least for some of the industries. And this means that there's this need for all the other policy options. And uh, we heard some of those, about some of those examples in the, in the first presentation. Um, obviously, a first one is to need innovation support to induce these kinds of technological shifts. And I think there I would like to especially point to sort of the demonstration part 
where you need, uh, because there's often plenty of, of investment or, or funding available if you do early research or pilot testing, but when you want to build like large facilities, uh, that's where it becomes more difficult to get funding. Uh, that is hopefully something that the EU Innovation Fund, for example, can change now in Europe. Um, then investment support might be one thing to do this transition. Um, you heard about this obviously to cover the capital expenses. Uh, in terms of looking at more OPEX support, uh, we heard about uh, some of these systems that we use in France. You can have contracts for difference for specifically for, for heat, for example. Uh, if you take more broader um, policy options, public procurement of, of products with low life cycle emissions is something that's also been, been discussed. For example, that if you build large infrastructure project, then you should only go for low carbon cement once that becomes available, of course. And something that's obviously very political right now is the to introduction of carbon border tax adjustment so that you would uh, include um, CO2 prices in one way or another in things in uh, sort of high emitting uh, products being imported to, to, to Europe, for example, in, include those in the, in the cost. All right, so this was just a quick overview um, and just to um, do a little bit of uh, advertising here, we, we do have a report that's coming up and it's going to map this in more detail in, in 2021. And you can follow this work on, on these websites. Um, and uh, it'll be very interesting to hear what uh, my uh, colleague Jap Kopian has to say about this project in the next presentation, give some more case studies. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. We have a lot of questions coming in. And I think I'll just give you one, which is uh, perhaps a little bit of a tough one, quick. And that is bioenergy when burned, of course, and it's CO2. And how do you make bioenergy clean holistically? Ah, it's a, it's a golden question, I guess. We, we touched upon <laughs> big, I, guess, I guess this is something that we always have to think of in all bioenergy systems is the whole supply chain sustainability um, discussion. And obviously, to me, that's something that's... Uh, um, it's, you know, it's not... It's not sort of self-explanatory, but to me, that's sort of the first building block because we can't, get, can't get that right, then we, you know, what's the point? So we have to have supply, sustainable supply chain. So I think that's a, a key thing that we have to work with in all these uh, examples. Okay, thank you. So our next speaker is, as Ol mentioned, is Yap Kopian. Uh, Yap has been working in the biomass area in Asia and Europe since 1993. He's the managing director of an R&D and consulting company focused on bioenergy called Pro Biomass BV. And he was the leader of the IEA Bioenergy Task 32 focused on combustion for several years. So yeah, it's my pleasure to let you take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, uh, for, for that nice introduction. Uh, I can't share my video yet, uh, I think. So you can't see me, but uh, I hope uh, this will be resolved in a, in a minute. No. Well, anyway, oh, there, there it goes. Yes, I hope you can see me now. That's good. We can see you. Yes, very good. I will share my screen as well. Um, yes. Can you see it now? Good. Yes. Very nice. Um, so yes, what I would like to share with you today is um, uh, some of the pre preliminary results of this inter-task project that we are carrying out at the moment under the framework of IA Bioenergy. Um, this is a collaborative effort by uh, five different tasks that are uh, currently involved in IA Bioenergy um, on the topic of uh, bioenergy heat, bioenergy-based heat and in industry to explore um, both on the one hand where uh, current applications are already incurring, uh, occurring, how they can be um, supported um, uh, or accelerated, and also uh, more generally where um, on the longer term the potential can be, uh, can be harvested. And I think uh, Ulla already shared some, some inside information about that uh, uh, topic. So today I would like to share with you one particularly one particular aspect of the project that's uh, that's four case studies that we carried out um, let's see if i can go to the next slide yes so um 
During the start of the session, Paulo Franco already mentioned uh, that, uh, well, bioenergy-based uh, heat in industry has a significant potential, and about half of that is really in high uh, temperature applications. But uh, on the other hand, also, the other half is uh, uh, up to about uh, 300 or 400 degrees centigrade. And um, there are quite a number of uh, good examples of that, uh, that type of application already in place. And, um, well, because there is still a, a big potential in that sector, I would like to share some of that uh, information with you now. Um, and most of those applications are based on process steam. So process steam is a very versatile way to, um, uh, to transfer heat. And uh, uh, it's, you can consider it's a, it's a proven uh, concept for um, making the... Uh, uh, making these industries more sustainable uh, and of course based on sustainable biomass that's evident you see here the the list of people that are involved in this project from uh, from five different tasks um, with their email addresses so um, i will refer to some of these people uh, later on in my presentation so we have four of these reports now available you can download them on the website uh, Ulu already shared the hyperlink of that uh, website. And if you go to iabioenergy.com, you can quickly find them, I think, if you search on the website. Um, so these, these four case studies uh, I will uh, share with you today. Uh, basically, the, the message of, of, of these case studies, all of them um, are focused on, uh, well, existing examples, how bioenergy is used for the delivery of high temperature heat in industry. Uh, just to uh, also be able to learn from that. So without further ado, I will go into the first case study, which is uh, uh, one that was carried out by task 32, the task that I'm involved in myself. It's, uh, it's a task focused on biomass combustion. Combustion is a, is a technology for biomass that has been applied for many, many centuries already, of course, uh, but it has been uh, evolved over time. Uh, it can be considered a really proven technology also for, uh, for very stable, robust uh, delivery of process heat in industry. Uh, so this particular example is, a, uh, is an example where a potato processing industry in the southern part of the Netherlands uh, is now using uh, steam uh, produced by wood chip combustion. Um, and you can see here on the picture here on the bottom side, uh, the bridge, um, literally a, a bridge with uh, uh, steam pipes that, that, that flow uh, to the other side of the road where the factory is, where the steam is consumed. And on the left hand side, you can see um, the industry where, uh, uh, or, or the installation where the steam is produced. This is a nine megawatt boiler and uh, it has been in operation since 2015. The idea to, to start this project uh, rose in 2010 when uh, the local municipalities in that region uh, were looking for a way to valorize their uh, public green waste. So this is low-grade biomass that, uh, that they had available in abundance and uh, would like to make a good use of. You can see here on the right-hand side what type of biomass it is. It's really very low-quality uh, wood chips. Uh, uh, you can't even call it wood chips, I think, but it's got quite a lot of ash in it. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it's quite a challenge to burn this uh, in, in a normal boiler. But if you design a proper system uh, with, um, uh, with a lot of full out hours per year, then it, this can be uh, very feasible. Um, so you have additional investment cost in a boiler. You have to take additional measures to make this uh, possible. But um, uh, the big advantage of industrial heat is often that you, you can uh, design a system with many full out hours and also on a substantial scale. So um, that, that results in the, in, in the possibility to use very low grade biomass that, uh, that also by its nature doesn't have any competing use and can therefore be used uh, on a longer term. It can be contracted for longer periods of time. Uh, uh, also uh, with, with a uh, substantially uh, lower price than uh, conventional wood chips. So this is one key aspect I would like to mention to start with. Uh, if you uh, have an industrial uh, heat demand, then usually you can go for low-grade biomass, and that's a, a key advantage. 
So in this, this example, we have a 10 megawatt boiler uh, that produces 20 bar or 19 bar of steam. Uh, it uses uh, almost 30,000 tons of, um, of, of biomass. And uh, by doing that, we, we save about 8 million cubic meters of natural gas. Um, in this case, there's also a flue gas condenser being used uh, because the, the steam is directly used in the process. It's not only uh, delivering heat, but also uh, used in the process of peeling potatoes. Um, and by doing that, uh, we need to provide makeup water and that results then in the option also to use a flue gas condenser. So the, uh, uh, all in all, this, uh, this, it, this results in a very high efficiency of the, of the installation. So just the key messages of this, uh, of this uh, particular case study to take home. Um, the size of the application, uh, in this case 10 megawatt, meets the local availability of these low-grade biomass residues that are available. And uh, that's a, uh, that's a, that has many advantages, as I already shared with you. Uh, however, you need to design your plant uh, according to, the, to, to this fuel specifications. In this case, a very low-grade fuel. Uh, the technology is available off the shelf, but uh, you have to be careful with um, uh, certain components, for example, sulfur uh, content or chlorine. Um, you have to choose the right materials for the boiler. Um, another lesson that was learned here was that uh, local stakeholders should be involved uh, from the start. Um, in this case, the factory is located close to a village uh, in a rural area. And, uh, there were uh, intense uh, discussions about uh, the uh, about the willingness of the of the village to to host the site. Uh, long term contracts were also um, uh, signed with both the the off taker of the steam, but also the biomass supplier. In this case, the investor in the plant was also the the same uh, party that uh, that had uh, the biomass available. So they, they were already processing the biomass and able to guarantee the, the quality of the, of the material. And then last but not least, uh, the technology uh, applied here is, uh, is, of, uh, is a very good one. So you should not uh, um, sacrifice on quality. Second case study that was carried out by TAS 33 is, uh, is not on combustion, but gasification of, uh, of biomass. Uh, this is a different case uh, at a different location. Uh, it uses uh, paper rejects. And this, this, uh, uh, this case study was carried out by, uh, by TNO, Sander Gootjes and Berend Vreugdehill. And uh, uh, the location of the plant is Eska in the Netherlands, in the northern part of the Netherlands. Uh, and uh, Bert Bodewis was, uh, was involved to, uh, uh, to provide information on this. Um, so this is a, basically a paper mill that, uh, that produces hard board um, for uh, various applications. Um, and uh, uh, in, in, in this site, there's a lot of steam uh, needed for the process uh, that used to be um, uh, produced using natural gas. Uh, but since, uh, uh, since a couple of years, uh, there's a CFB gasifier installed that is run on the on paper on, on rejects that are available uh, on site. So here you have uh, rejects that are gasified in a CFB gasifier, uh, and then uh, uh, the gas that is being produced is uh, burned in a separate boiler to produce process steam of uh, uh, almost 200 degrees, 14 bar. And uh, this is uh, also a, a compatible comparable scale. Uh, depending on, uh, on, on process conditions between 13 and uh, between 10 and 13 megawatt of, uh, of uh, fuel is being burned there. You can see here a, a Google map um, uh, picture from the, from the side. It's really inside an urban area around the plant. There are, there are people living and it's really an urban area, you could say. So this posed quite some issues on the, uh, on, on the design of the plant. And they took some measures here uh, to avoid uh, smell, for example, uh, safety, the air quality, there's extensive flue gas cleaning on the plant. Um, also the view um, of, of the whole site, it's surrounded by trees, for example, and um, a, a big advantage for the, for, for the local inhabitants of the site, because it's such an urbanized area, is that uh, there were le less trucks now um, 
driving over the over the roads um, because um, uh, previously the uh, the waste had to be disposed of externally. Now it can be now it can stay on site. So this resulted in uh, less uh, waste movements. So this was an advantage in, in this case. Normally, it's a problem if you uh, it can be a problem if you build a new biomass plant because you have additional movements. But now they were less. See so here in total the economic and environmental impact of the of the project. Uh, it resulted in less waste, uh, less consumption of natural gas, also less primary energy in total, uh, due to efficiency measures that that were uh, uh, that were uh, initiated. Um, the amount of CO two emission also reduced. You could uh, you can see here uh, that this is uh, to a large extent I think fossil no, renewable CO two uh, from biomass. Uh, so you you, you could. Uh, argue whether this should maybe be counted as zero, but nevertheless, they, uh, they put the figure up here. And the total uh, process costs are, uh, are also lower. So, uh, so both environmentally and economically uh, uh, success story. The third case study is again on a, on a different uh, conversion technology. We discussed before combustion and gasification. Now this is liquefaction. It's a technology uh, that has been developed in the Netherlands by, uh, by Biomass Technology Group, BTG. Um, and um, this case study uh, was done by Bert van der Belt and Ari Toussaint from uh, BTG. Basically, the concept here is that um, uh, uh, fast pyrolysis oil is being produced from uh, wood chips. Uh, you can see here on the schematic diagram that uh, the concept, we have a fast pyrolysis plant where uh, fast pyrolysis bio oil is being produced. Uh, it is then trucked to uh, to the site of, a, in this case, a dairy mill that uh, that uses the the oil to uh, uh, to generate process steam also in a new boiler. You can see here the photograph of the of the plant that was uh, uh, in, that has that is in operation for a couple of years now. This is a production site for fast pyrolysis oil, and. Uh, uh, the oil is uh, being stored uh, temporarily and then shipped to the to the dairy industry. This is the the new boiler system or a schematic of that. Um, you can see here the new boiler uh, that can be can be uh, operated with both natural gas uh, and uh, uh, FPBO, the fast pyrolysis bio oil. Uh, up to seventy percent of the fuel input is uh, coming from fast pyrolysis oil. And um, normally 30% uh, from natural gas to stabilize the flame and uh, heat production. And uh, 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 in case there would be a problem with the, with the new burner, you see a, uh, a drawing of the, of the new design for the, for, for the oil burner here. Uh, if there would be any problem with that, they can also run 100% on natural gas. Uh, in addition to, uh, to the boiler, uh, there, there were also flue gas cleaning. Uh, measures uh, taken uh, to to achieve low emissions here. So why was uh, was was the decision taken to go for this technology? Uh, you, you can see here if you compare uh, fast pyrolysis oil burner to uh, to a normal biomass boiler, then of course uh, you don't have all the uh, restrictions with uh, uh, space space requirements here. Uh, you only need a, a, a tank on site to, to store the uh, fast pyrolysis oil and then uh, modify the, the burner uh, in an existing boiler. And uh, that takes up much less space. Uh, also, in this case, it's a food industry and uh, uh, food industries are uh, always a little bit hesitant to accept biomass uh, uh, on the same site uh, if, if it is not really of a very uh, guaranteed uh, quality all the time. And so heat hygienic aspects with uh, fungus, for example, could be an issue. And if you store any, uh, everything in, in closed vessels, then uh, this can be addressed properly. So um, this does result, of course, in high OPEX. You have an expensive fuel uh, compared to, uh, to wood chips, for example. But uh, on the other hand, there are investment costs on, on site where the, where the fuels used is relatively low. So um, this is a high OPEX, low CAPEX option. And um, for, uh, in this case, this, this was considered attractive. So you can use it in peak load operation instead of in base load. And uh, on, the, uh, on the other end, you can also have redundancy in the same boiler by 
installing another burner. So yeah, this if I could ask you to please try to wrap up pretty soon. Yes, yes, I will uh, uh, just have Thank a few you. more slides. But there is a chicken egg problem here when using uh, FPBO. It's a new application and you need to design both, you need to install both the production and, and the utilization of it. The last case study uh, I will go through quickly is uh, uh, done by Rice in Sweden and Henrik Pristaf and Marido. Uh, this is a paper mill in uh, Western Sweden where uh, steam is used like in a lot of paper mills. It used to be very dependent on oil. Uh, the oil boilers were quite old and uh, the oil became more expensive. So they decided to, uh, to switch over to waste. Uh, so they, they are now burning municipal solid waste in this plant uh, to deliver the base load uh, demand for steam in the paper mill. So basically uh, uh, the, the waste fuel comes from the neighboring municipalities and also from Norway. Uh, it, it's basically a waste of energy plant that um, uh, where the uh, where the energy produced is delivered to the to the paper mill now about eighty thousand tons of uh, waste is uh, being processed here in the uh, in the in, in the boiler with uh, twenty three megawatts of uh, of heat uh, quite a standard uh, 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 waste of energy plant I would say and uh, uh, some of the heat also goes for district heating in the region. So environmentally, we have a reduced CO2 emission here. Also, the air quality in the region uh, uh, is reduced because, uh, because of the fact that uh, clean district heating was introduced. Um, waste to landfill was reduced. Uh, bottom ash can be reused and uh, fly ash is also being used. So very good environmental benefits. So generally to sum up, uh, when I look back at all these case studies that you can conclude that there are several technology fuel combinations available commercially. Uh, which one to apply it where, to be applied where, it depends really on the local conditions. And uh, the potential is really uh, not only limited to energy intensive industries, but also process industries are also already today very attractive to, uh, to invest in. Um, the annual amount of fuel needed to cover an industrial heat demand can in many cases be sourced locally. I uh, showed you the example of this uh, potato processing industry. Uh, so this is, this is the interesting aspect, I think, about uh, medium-sized industries that the local uh, biomass availability often matches the demand for, uh, for biomass. So this was my final slide. If there are any questions, I would like to please uh, hear about that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gop, and I think we'll save additional questions until the moderated session. And we do now have one more Slido question that relates to the app's presentation. If you could yes, see that yes. up. Uh, I'll put that up. Okay, so you hear, here you see the results of the previous poll, which uh, clearly gives a majority for uh, input for chemicals and, and for process steam. Now let's go to the third question, which is indeed related to, to Jaap's presentation. So which form of biomass do you think has most potential as a fuel for this, uh, these industrial heat applications? Put a number of options here, you, you can select a few, but uh, what do you think are really the, the most important ones that you, you think? Again, reminder for everybody, uh, if you haven't connected, you can go to slido.com uh, with the access code of uh, P988. Okay, let's see for now, uh, preference for biogas and, and all the gaseous forms of, uh, of biomass. Okay. I'll let it run, but for uh, for time's sake, I will uh, suggest we go to the next presentation and then we, you will see the final results of this poll. Um, I think after uh, after Richard Ochi's presentation. Okay. Okay, thank you, Luke. Next, I'd like to introduce Min Hap Nguyen from Nestle. He works in Nestle France uh, since 2007. 
Where he's currently the Energy and Sustainability Operations Manager. He's responsible for defining the Nestle France Sustainable Development Policy and Greenhouse Gas Emissions Reduction Roadmap, which sounds challenging and interesting. So I'll turn it over to you and help your presentation. Thank you. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, thank you um, for giving me the opportunity to share with you um, what we have um, implemented in France. And in this presentation, I'm going to show you um, to present you how biomass boilers are fully integrated in our strategy um, towards uh, carbon uh, neutrality by uh, 2050. So, as you may know, uh, Nestle, Nestle um, accelerates uh, our action to tackle climate change, and we are committed uh, to zero net emission by 2050 for the whole value chain. Uh, that means from uh, the ingredients to uh, the store. And I'm, I'm in charge of uh, the uh, manufacturing part, uh, let's say uh, the operations with factories to uh, uh, drive, uh, you know, the uh, roadmap uh, towards uh, carbon neutrality. So let's say over the past 10 years, Nestle France has already committed to reduce um, by 35% of its uh, emissions by 2020 versus uh, 2010 baseline. So we have already uh, started uh, our uh, strategy and implemented uh, action uh, to reduce uh, our emissions. So looking now into the details of uh, manufacturing. Um, so, uh, we, have, we, we don't see your slides. Can you, can you share your screen? Ah, sorry. Why? Yes. So is it okay now? Oh, sorry. Yes. Okay. So looking into the details of uh, manufacturing, um, as you can see in, on this uh, chart, where we are today and what we have already achieved. Uh, this curve shows uh, our CO2 emission reduction from 2010 uh, with uh, two um, actions, major actions. First one from uh, 2011 to 2016 with the implementation of our four uh, biomass boilers. So I'm, I'm going to um, give you more details later on in this presentation. Uh, second one is uh, the, to use uh, renewable ACCT certificates from um, 2018. And to achieve our 2025 and 2030 reduction targets in absolute value, uh, I would say it will be very challenging uh, considering uh, the gross uh, expectation. So just to show you, this is our high-level uh, roadmap for decarbonizing uh, our factories in France. Um, our the first step as a foundation is um, to go for energy efficiency, uh, reducing our energy consumption as much as possible, um, recovering all the waste heat to preheat uh, hot water, building heating uh, where it's possible, by taking the opportunity to use heat pumps as well uh, to higher uh, to heat up uh, the temperature in order to uh, to be able to use direct uh, in process. Uh, as we use already renewable cert electricity certificates, um, the next step is to go for uh, corporate PPA. The third axis is going uh, for technology change with new CapEx uh, projects and for sure uh, to be uh, zero carbon design, uh, by design. Um, fourth is to keep implementing a biomass boiler in factory where it makes sense and where we have uh, the uh, biomass resources available close to our factories. Um, biomass, uh, let's say it's an option we consider for decarbonizing in France, as um, wood chips, uh, the wood resources um, is uh, available uh, and are also sustainable. 
and for sure to go for zero emission for manufacturing, we target, uh, we target to use uh, biogas uh, as well. And biogas projects uh, will be developed along with uh, local farmers around the factory using our wastes uh, also. So going into the details in our what we have already achieved over the past 10 years, uh, let's say um, this uh, our journey started uh, 10 years ago almost, you know, with the, uh, the, um, the support from the uh, French uh, government. So yeah, I can um, highlight uh, the fact is the journey is fully in line with our Nestle uh, uh, objective to reduce uh, our emissions from uh, 2005. So the first um, implementation, the first uh, biomass boiler was implemented in our Dolce Gusto factory in 2000, 2011. In, um, in this factory, we produce milk powder for the capsules uh, Dolce Gusto. And replacing, we replace uh, a very old uh, heavy fuel oil uh, boiler. And that's why we contribute to reduce 8,000 tons of CO2. Um, and this boiler provides more than 90% of the steam demand from the factory. And this project has received financial support from ADEM at around 30% of the uh, CAPEX. And Charange is the first uh, Nestle factory in Europe to use the wood chips uh, to produce uh, uh, energy, uh, to produce steam uh, for process for, for process use. So let's say this first success um, confirmed our CO2 reduction strategy by implementing uh, biomass boiler, and we keep uh, implementing it in all the big thermal uh, consumer factory, replacing uh, coal, heavy fuel oils, and also natural gas. Um, maybe one more important thing we'd like to highlight and to tell you is that uh, this uh, strategy um, has been fully supported by uh, from um, we had uh, at this time a, a visionary let's say a sponsor our former head of operations uh, of our Nestle group um, to me let's say without without his support Maybe this uh, could never happen or very uh, will be uh, happen very later on. Uh, he used to say, uh, you know, that for to implement this project, it's not a payback project. Just do it. And to keep uh, reducing our emissions, uh, two other biomass boilers have been implemented uh, in um, 2013 at ERTA. Uh, a chain culinary uh, factory and also muslin factory. You know, this is a very famous brand in France uh, for mashed potatoes, uh, contributing to reduce uh, more than uh, 30,000 tons of CO2 emissions uh, with both uh, projects. And in 2016, um, our Nescafe factory replaced its uh, all coal boiler by a mix, um, mixed biomass boiler using um, coffee ground. This is a byproduct from a uh, coffee process and wood chips. And this project uh, contributed to, to reduce more than 50% uh, of, our, of um, the factory emissions. And the, the four biomass boilers use 100% uh, of um, certified wood chips, uh, PEFC. Uh, this is a certification for, to, uh, you know, for um, wood management that uh, say that uh, the forest uh, was well managed. Um, sustainable management using sustainable management practices. So here is the, uh, the key figures from our four biomass boiler implemented between 2011 and 2016. 
And Nestle France is now considered uh, as a reference uh, within our group uh, for uh, biomass boilers. And let's say, as I already highlighted, um, biomass will, is part of our strategy. And this journey will continue with uh, two other projects with um, our Purina pet food business. And two projects have already been approved by ADEM for granting uh, financial support. And so, so the two boilers is under construction. And we have, um, we are working right now on two other projects uh, for um, Nestle Nutrition. Um, and the two projects are um, ongoing uh, study. And let's say Nestle France has reduced more than 50% of its emissions right now versus 2010 uh, with this uh, biomass uh, boiler journey. Um, Biomass energy is, let's say, I can say it's renewable and sustainable energy um, in France. Uh, we, have, we have these uh, resources let's, uh, available. And that's why it, uh, the, the biomass boiler is fully um, integrated in our decarbonation strategy. Um, and we aim to be carbon neutral for all our factory by 2030. So that's, that's it. That is the, uh, the um, outlook of uh, our strategy for decarbonization for, for France. So if you have uh, questions, Thank you, Matt. That's very impressive, uh, your installations and your goals. I think we'll move on, given that uh, we're about 90 minutes into our two-hour session, and we'll save the questions for the moderated session. So next, I'd like to introduce our last speaker, who is Richard O'Shea. He's a senior postdoctoral researcher with the Bioenergy and Biofuels Research Group, part of Murray, which is based in the University of College Cork in Ireland. Richard received his PhD from there in 2018 on the topic of pathways to renewable gas industry in Ireland. And his current research is focused on assessing the potential use of biogas to decarbonize large companies in the food and beverage sector. So Richard, thank you. It's your turn. Uh, thank you very much, Jim. Just to confirm, can you see my title slide? Yes. Excellent. <clears throat> Uh, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Richard O'Shea, and Jim has kindly introduced me, so I'll get straight into my presentation, which is going to be on decarbonization of whiskey production using circular economy bioenergy systems. So first, just a little bit of background about MARI. It is the Science Foundation Ireland Research Centre for Energy, Climate, and the Marine. There are seven key research areas, and it is spread across 13 academic institutions and is comprised of 200 researchers. And I think last year it was about 65 million euro worth of research funding allocated. Uh, My own expertise are within the area of bioenergy. Um, I work in the Biofuels and Bioenergy Research Group, which is headed by Professor Jerry D. Murphy in University College Cork. And Professor Murphy is also the IEA Bioenergy Task 37 lead on energy from biogas. So looking at the production of whiskey, uh, the process and how it uses energy, typically you would start off with a type of cereal. It might be barley, it might be rye, it might be corn or maize. Um, that cereal then undergoes several steps, um, milling, brewing, fermentation, distillation, whether it is a pot distillation process or a continuous distillation process to produce um, distilled spirits, and then maturation typically inside oak casks. All of that can be bundled together to give you the distillation process. And the end product is whiskey. Byproducts from the brewing and distillation processes um, typically contain draft, which are the spent grains from brewing, 
um, pot ale from distillation in batches, and then thin stillage and thick stillage in the event that uh, corn is used to produce the whiskey. Currently, these byproducts are processed in a feed recovery system, um, typically involving evaporation or some sort of thickening process to produce animal feed. The main inputs into the whiskey distillation process are fairly standard. You would have electrical energy consumption by various motors or evaporators. You would also have fossil fuel consumption for the production of process steam, which is used within the distillation process and the evaporation process, brewing and cooking, and also cleaning in place or CIP. Um, the thermal energy and electrical energy consumption per liter of whiskey produced uh, can be seen here. It varies widely depending on the type of distillation process you have, whether it is batch distillation or continuous distillation, and there are variations depending on the economies of scale, whether or not your distillery is producing a million liters per annum or 64 million liters per annum, for example. So how can, the, how can bioenergy in the circular economy be integrated into whiskey production systems? Well, primarily it would be through the use of your byproducts, your draft, your pot ale, your thin stillage and thick stillage, either through combustion or anaerobic digestion to produce renewable heat, or from using some of your processed animal feeds. Um, the advantage of this system is that by evaporating some of the liquid or water from your liquid residues, it reduces the mass of residue that you have to treat in your anaerobic digester and that will have positive effects that I will touch on later in this presentation. Additionally, to complete the circularity of this system, digestate from your anaerobic digestion system can be reapplied to land which is used for cereal cultivation. Um, this avoids the need for synthetic fertilizers like calcium ammonia nitrate and can reduce the greenhouse gas emissions associated with the value chain or supply chain of the distillery. Um, this is not a new idea. There's plenty of literature out there in academia, and there are plenty of these plants operating in reality. Uh, a good number of them in Scotland, and one in Ireland in Slane Distillery, where they would process their byproducts to produce biogas. One thing that I will not consider in this presentation is the combustion of the residues from the distillation process and the brewing process, um, mostly because the nitrogen value associated with your byproducts is then lost in the flue gas. Um, you cannot offset your synthetic nitrogen fertilizer if you burn your byproducts. So previous research from our research group, uh, published by Dr. Shi He Kang in the Journal of Cleaner Production, assessed the production of whiskey in a batch distillation system and looked at the byproducts, specifically draft and pot ale, and proposed that these be used in an anaerobic digester to produce biogas, which can then be burned either to produce process steam um, or to produce combined heat and power. Um, Dr. Kang also looked at the impact of pretreatment on the feedstocks in four separate scenarios and assessed the energy and CO2 savings that a distillery could expect to achieve if they were to use their byproducts in an anaerobic digester. Um, based on the different scenarios, um, if you were to use biogas for heat, you could reduce your thermal energy consumption by 46%, the CO2 emissions of 42%. If you pretreat your byproducts using hydrothermal pretreatment processes, 50% um, of your thermal demand could be replaced, or 40 and 46% reduction in CO2 could occur. If the biogas was to produce electricity and heat, 23% of the thermal demand could be reduced, as well as 408% of the um, electrical energy demand of the CH of the distillery. And the excess uh, electricity was proposed to be exported to the grid, um, resulting in 56% CO2 reduction by offsetting grid electricity. And then scenario four has slightly increased numbers. This can be kind of summarized in this graph here. What is interesting, and this kind of ties back to the prior presentation, is that a lot of large scale distilleries already and food processors already source their electricity through guarantees of origin or through corporate PPAs from renewable sources, which means that the remaining energy that must be decarbonized is in essence heat. And from that perspective, the use of biogas from your byproducts to reduce your fossil fuel consumption for the production of thermal energy 
is probably a preferential route in this case. Further work that I did publish recently in 2020 was looking at a very large distillery in the Republic of Ireland, which produces 64 million litres of whiskey per annum and assessing the viability of AD at this distillery. Again, you start off with your distillation process, taking your cereals, producing your whiskey, and you have your products, specifically draft, thin stillage from distillation on barley and thick stillage from distillation using corn as an input. Currently, these are processed in a feed recovery plant um, to produce a number of byproducts or feed products, moist grains, syrup, and dry distiller's grains. The proposal assessed was to use these byproducts in an anaerobic digester um, and essentially remove your feed product production. Um, in this scenario, all of the byproducts were used in an AD plant to produce biogas, again, to reduce CO2 emissions at your distillery. Scope one greenhouse gas emissions associated with direct fuel combustion under the control of the distillery um, can be reduced. So if you were to use all of your byproducts, you could produce 154 gigawatt hours per annum of biogas, which would offset 61% of the current gas consumption of the distillery. However, if you no longer run your feeds recovery plant, your gas consumption reduces, which means you could offset 64% of the residual gas consumption. Um, Scope one emission savings of 27 kilotons of CO2 could be realized. Um, scope one savings are the greenhouse gas emissions associated with combustion of fuel on site or by operations directly controlled by the distillery. Um, and there are also some scope three emission savings associated with reducing your natural gas consumption um, by reducing the amount of emissions associated with sourcing the natural gas. Scope three are the emissions associated with procedures that are outside of the direct control of the distillery, such as within their supply chain. As well as that, digestive can be applied to land surrounding the distillery, and this would offset calcium ammonia nitrate application and therefore reduce greenhouse gas emissions associated with the production of cereals. And this would result in a scope three greenhouse gas emission saving. Um, digesting all of the byproducts would produce about 600,000 tons of digestive, which is a considerable amount. Um, it could offset about 1,180 tonnes of calcium ammonium nitrate, which is the most commonly used agricultural fertiliser in Ireland, as well as offsetting about 500 tonnes of phosphorus. And that's probably quite important, as most of the phosphorus in the world is currently mined in North Africa. The scope three CO2 emission savings associated with this project would be about 11,000 tonnes of CO2. So by using AD, you can reduce your scope one emissions and as well as that, the scope three emissions of your supply chain. However, there is no such thing as a free lunch. There are a number of drawbacks associated with digesting absolutely everything. Specifically, the logistics of dealing with your digestive. And this is the circular economy aspect of this system is re reusing your nutrients. However, you want to reuse your nutrients, you may have to transport your digestive up to 50 kilometers away from your plant, which may not be financially or economic or environmentally viable. 50% of the digestive would be applied to land within 25 kilometers of your distillery, which means the remaining 50% will have to be applied at a considerable distance. If you were to store all of the digestate centrally at the digester, you would need 541,000 meters cubed of storage which is quite large. Um, as well as that, to transport the digestate to agricultural land, the optimal times of application would require 249 trucks per hour for the first application of digestate in mid-March, or 581 trucks per hour for the second application of digestate to land in mid-April. And this is totally unviable owing to the road infrastructure surrounding the current distillery. Decentralized storage of digestate at each of these little electoral divisions or parcels of land and would require 126 storage tanks and would reduce the number of truck movements. However, there's still a significant number required. Most concerning is the replacement of animal feed with imported byproducts. There was a perception that if animal feed was no longer produced, it would be replaced with soybean meal from the Amazon rainforest in Brazil. However, this analysis found that most of it would actually be produced with dry distillers grains imported from the US from bioethanol production, and the amount required would only be about 5% of the total annual imports for Ireland in 2018. 
However, there is a CO2 emission associated with the production and transportation of these feed products of about 32,000 tons of CO2. This is outside of the scope three emissions, but may still weigh on the decision makers' minds at the distillery and brings into question, well, what is true sustainability? Some soybean meal is required. Um, however, this is mostly sourced from Argentina. And these were based on an energy and protein balance um, based on the composition of current feed production and the composition of imported feeds. Summing up the research, um, you can see that, yes, if you digest everything, um, you can save a considerable amount of scope one CO2 emissions by reducing your greenhouse uh, gas emissions from natural gas consumption. It is possible to reduce scope three emissions from your value chain by replacing fertilizer used in the cultivation of barley consumed at the distillery. However, when you digest absolutely everything, there are considerable emissions associated with importing animal feed. In total, um, you're still about 500 tonnes of CO2 better off. You, you saved about 500 tonnes of CO2. However, deciding which one of these savings and deciding what are the key criteria um, should, be should be taken into account when using byproducts for the production of biogas at food processing sites. So future work would be trying to figure out how to best achieve balance between the benefits and drawbacks associated with circular bioenergy systems at a distillery. Specifically weighing up the positives, your scope one emission savings by reducing your natural gas consumption, potential electricity savings by removing or reducing the amount of feed recovery taking place, and scope three emission savings associated with using your digestate on land. However, these, as I said, have to be balanced with your drawbacks, specifically um, the loss of animal feed production at the site and potential impacts on the local feed production the requirement to import animal feed and the CO2 emissions associated with that, and then the logistics around digestate management in this circular system, the storage volumes required, the truck movements required, and of course, the cost. And it, these can be weighed up in a multi-criteria decision analysis using compromise programming or any other MCDA methods. However, I think it is pertinent to realize that sustainable use of residues from food processing isn't always 100% win-win. There are considerations that have to be made and compromises that will have to be achieved in order to achieve a fully sustainable um, bioenergy system in terms of environmental impact, economic impact, and social acceptance. Thank you very much for your time. If you have any questions, I'll do my best to answer them. Richard, thank you very much for pointing out some of the practical challenges of these real world applications. So uh, in the interest of time, we're going to go to the moderated session, but first we're going to have one more Slido question from Luke and then I'll turn it over to Mark to help us uh, take us through the moderated session. Okay, uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, so these were the results of the previous uh, Slido questions. So which form of biomass do you think has most potential uh, as a fuel for industrial heat and uh, Actually, the highest preference uh, so far is for uh, for biogas or the, the, the gaseous fuels and then for wood chips. But uh, again, for the sake of time, let's go to the next poll question. So, which is a little bit of the introduction for the, uh, the Q&A now also. Um, what do you see as the most important obstacle to an increased of use of biomass for industrial heat? Uh, we provided a number of options here. Um, I think you can select uh, two of them, which, which you think are, are most relevant. So uh, it's either yeah, fossil alternatives are too cheap or uh, biomass fuel is too complicated or the supply is too complicated. There's technical difficulties uh, for the required heat qualities uh, or other renewables are more promising or biomass is too controversial. So uh, uh, please go ahead uh, if, you're, if you're not in Slido yet, join at slido.com with the access code B988 you can also go through your uh, your smartphone. Thank you, Luke. Now I'd like to go straight to uh, Mark to take us through the, some of the questions. And the panelists can also ask each other questions if you like. Thanks, Jim. Um, so I've been watching the questions that have come in from the the group during the presentations. Um, 
Jim has picked up some of those throughout, um, but there's some overarching to continue remaining questions there that I'll aim to cover some of them through this discussion with the uh, presenters or the panelists in this session. Um, in the first instance, uh, and there's a few questions that touch on this in some form or the other, uh, you do note that the, the topic of the workshop is the role of bioenergy uh, in the emerging circular economy. And it's been noted um, in a couple of different ways in these questions around the potential other uses of biomass um, other than energy and potentially higher value uses. And then in a more general term, how we see the total vo uh, available biomass or sustainable biomass availability across Europe meeting the increasing demand of both more or more renewable heat or, or, and other energy uses along with these other demands. So I was just wondering if um, each of the panel members could maybe give their thoughts on the capacity or the, the scope to increase heat production for industrial purposes balanced against those other uses and sustainability issues. Uh, and I, I might just ask to, for the, in the interest of organization, if we just go through the presenters in the order they presented to start with that question. Uh, Mark, can I intervene? We, I also put up uh, some central questions at Slido now. Uh, so there's three questions, one on the main challenges, one on what we can learn from uh, current applications and one uh, what's needed in terms of policies. Uh, all these three questions are available for, uh, for the audience to, to give their input. So please feed us uh, with as much ideas as possible and then we can, uh, can also take those into account. Thank you. Yeah, so we'll, we'll be able to come back to those as people post some thoughts and you'll be able to agree or disagree with people's points there. Um, and maybe just get our presenters to give the thoughts on that initial question and we'll come back through those. So, um, first presenter from the session. That'd be David. Yeah, sorry. Perhaps just Mark, looking. you could restate the question just quickly. Um, just looking at the scope or opportunities for increased industrial heat production balanced against potential future high value um, other products, productions, or other energy opportunities, whether it be biofuels, um, liquid biofuels, and um, transport fuels, and those kind of things, what, what the balance is in terms of achieving that sustainably. So. Um, what I would, David, if you'd like. To, yes. Just go ahead. What I would say about this is uh, this is um, a cost. Uh, this is a cost problem. We um, in, in France we support uh, innovation processes and also deployment of uh, of major uh, boilers. And um, what we can see is that uh, even for major boilers with uh, wood chips or or pellets uh, or waste um, biomass, the problem of uh, of the competition with the gas price is really important right now. Uh, we, we have a special call for projects each year for industrials um, boilers, industrials, ind industrials uh, biomass boilers. And um, what we can see is that this year, the competition with, uh, with the gas, gas price is even higher than, than, um, than before. And, we have a gas price that is lower than the biomass price, uh, except except for um, for uh, paper industries or uh, wood industries, uh, which do not really pay for um, for their uh, biomass. But this is the main issue, the competitiveness, and that's why the OPEX support, um, some kind of contract for difference support, is really uh, is really important. Thank you, David. Um, 
So if if it is my turn, yes, I please. can only I can only fully concur uh, with uh, what David just said. Um, I think uh, from a bioenergy supply point of view, of course, the bioenergy for heat makes a lot of sense. But I really would uh, warn not always to have um, a too much bioenergy focused discussion, but look at the outer world. And uh, what Dave just said is that the, 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 the competition with very low fossil fuel prices, in particular for heat, and in the absence of a carbon price for heat applications, at least for small heat applications, all this um, uh, emphasizes the fact that there is a policy gap, a very urgent policy gap actually in this area, without which it is difficult to, to foster these particularly um, applications. I think um, this is another comment, if I may, um, if I may uh, add one remark of, of an interesting presentation. Someone said correctly so. Um, the total increase in the final price is very small, even if you do a change in the process. That's absolutely true. And this is definitely affordable, but the problem is always the competition with the rest. So if let's assume you do um, a change for bioenergy and you use better processes in the European industry, but the Chinese industry does not adapt, and then the competition is, is not distorted, but let's say it's changed. If you don't uh, resolve that, and if you don't look at the competitiveness in industry, uh, that's, uh, this is going nowhere. I mean, uh, please remind that the industry people, the first thing that they need to do is a viable business uh, making profits and money. We can never, um, we can never forget that. Mark, you may be muted. No, sorry. Um, just looking. I'm not sure I have the order of the presenters right here. Yap, do you have any thoughts on the question? Yap or O or anyone at this point? Sorry, I was unmuted. Uh, I was muted. Uh, yeah, so what's needed uh, so on, on this question right now on policies this, this is a new question i think well, i i was still looking at the question of the the scope to grow uh, industrial heat in, in the context of increased biomass demand for other bioproducts and other biofuels um yeah, I think in terms what, of sustainable what's, supply and high value use. Yeah, what we noticed here, uh, I think in Western Europe, is that uh, demonstration projects are extremely valuable in that. So, uh, the more uh, exa good examples we see of uh, industrial heat, uh, uh, the, the more uh, replicable uh, good examples we see, uh, the, the, the more easier it becomes for other industries to apply it as well. This is what we, what we see. So the technologies are not um, uh, very complicated. They are proven, uh, as I showed, but, uh, and there are many options available. But uh, uh, there is some hesitance uh, from industry uh, who consider that it is new, uh, who are just not aware of the options. So awareness, I think, is, uh, is key here. And Richard? Um, in terms of trying to grow the use of biomass for the production of thermal energy in industry, while looking at the different uses of biomass, I think it's interesting to look at the presentations that were given, um, looking at YAP's presentation, looking at MIN's presentation, a lot of the biomass that was used was possibly residual biomass that was low value. It was either municipal waste or it might have been used coffee grounds. Um, I think it, it, one of the key principles of a circular economy is that you, you reuse materials, but at each step you try and extract the greatest economic value from them. Um, you mentioned, um, I think, Paolo, Frank, uh, Paolo mentioned that we have one planet. The amount of resources we have are limited. And I think in terms of trying to extract the most valuable or the most difficult product from biomass first, um, 
might be a more ethical method of using it and then possibly looking at energy recovery from the residuals of some sort of biorefinery, in my opinion, would be a more ethical approach um, than just burning or processing virgin biomass that could potentially have a higher use to produce feed or chemicals. Um, but I suppose those are my, those are my two cents. And Min, did you have a thought to add before we go into the slider questions? Yes, to me, the most important thing is we have um, we, we have to identify if we have the resources available around um, where we need to, to use. Um, for us, it's around our factories. And we need to be sure that these resources are sustainable. And you know how the uh, how is it uh, pro produce? Um, and let's say for us we need, we choose to to use um, um, wood chips, certified wood chips, uh, with uh, you know the uh, organism um, uh, national organization for forest ONF Energy in France. That is the the key we we. That is the key thing to me to to be uh, sustainable with biomass. Thank you. I'm just conscious of time and, and wanting to um, review the the slider questions and the feedback coming here. Um, Luke, are you controlling the scroll of that, or is that an automatic scroll of the different answers? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing that. <laughs> you're, you're filtering through. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. So just noting there's, there's been a fairly strong response on what are the main challenges for using biomass. Um, real tricky to consolidate on, on the fly here, but um, cost of supply and complexity of supply, whether that be transport cost or, or distance. Um, and those costs as they relate to competing solutions such as fossil fuels, particularly at the moment. Um, as was pointed out in one of the presentations, we're at a point in time where fossil fuels are at a very low point in the price cycle, um, but also in that same presentation pointed out that that's a short-term versus the medium and long-term cycles and trends that we need to be aware of when making these, um, these strategic decisions. Um, I guess, Luke, any other trends in those answers? I guess um, strong support of policy and legislation is also noted as a, being important for that success um, or, or overcoming the challenges. Um, yeah, I think I think the main thing coming out here is is yeah, you know, the right quality, the right price, the right periods. Um, also, existing assets uh, are very important. Uh, sustainable biomass supply, um, but cost is really coming out as as really crucial part. Yeah. Did Did any of the presenters want to comment on the that group feedback as we move on to the the second slide or question? Okay, just conscious yeah. of time again, we might uh, move to the, the other question, Luke. Okay. Well, Mark, excuse me, let's do a quick process question. Can we run, this is a question for Ernesto or Chiara, can we run another 15 minutes or 30 minutes? Is there any problem with that? Yes, still no, want to stay no problems, yes. Okay, thank you. So Mark, back to you. Okay, thank you. Um, lessons can we, what lessons can we learn from the current applications such as the food, food industry presented by Nestle. Um, do, 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 do the biomass, I think there was a point raised uh, by one of the responses to my earlier question that um, a common thread across a lot of the case studies was it was capturing relatively low value residue towards a heat production uh, in, in terms of um, acknowledging or, or um, working within the concept of highest value use first. Um, 
there's some points here about advancing the technologies, um, particularly around second, third generation biofuels, quality of the technology, um, the importance of managing the CO2 uh, as a cycle or, or, or ensuring that the biomass or the bio heat is actually a, a CO2 advantage in that context. Can Luke, any, any threads or commonalities that you're uh, also, I think also the last point that, that Richard mentioned is, is if you start to get into a certain competition, uh, like like uh, feed products or so, uh, this is also important to take into account. Which is going to be influenced by that challenge we noted around the cost and cost and value. Yeah. Okay, I might just move to the third slide of question. What is needed in terms of policy and market conditions to increase the role of sustainable biomass in medium scale industries? Um, right off the bat, we've got a very strong response around carbon value, carbon pricing. Um, and then that uh, genuine governmental support or push through policy and and subsidies that we heard about getting traction to a number of um, cases in the presentation. Um, so implementation of sustainability criteria linking back to that carbon impact. Um, balancing the cost against existing technology. So again, that comes into the potential support and subsidies and financing, meaningful price on carbon. So that's coming through quite, quite commonly as a, a theme here. Payments, job creation. Yeah, so I, I think we're kind of consolidating around that price competitiveness, the, the carbon value being important to promoting bioheat, um, as well as that support of policy and, and, and governmental support. And I think it was mentioned in one of the presentations about um, systems used to recognize the other values of, of the bioheat, not necessarily captured in the typical economic um, elements of the heat and energy production. Uh, and again, sorry not to, um, if the any of the panelists have comments on either of those three Slido questions. Hey Mark, I, I think that it's um, like most of the responses have been primarily around the cost, whether it would be at the OPEX or the CAPEX gap um, faced by medium scale industries. Um, and I suppose this is probably linked back to the low cost of fossil fuels. So is it a case of like, are you relying on individual governments to offset that cost like in EDEM or is there like, do, do the other panelists think there should be some wider, wider action to promote the use of biomass specifically in medium scale industries, which might have tighter profit margins than the larger multinational scale industries? Yeah, maybe, uh, but maybe this issue is also linked to uh, to one other note that was uh, marked a few times. Say carbon tax policies. Uh, I see that here uh, in a few <laughs> a few notes. Uh, so, uh, so maybe that would also help once that becomes more uh, more effective uh, in, in in the EDS in Europe, for example. This could 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 be uh, uh, quite a good incentive maybe for um, for reducing carbon uh, carbon dioxide, but. Um, uh, at the moment, I think we're, we're quite uh, dependent uh, still on uh, on subsidies, uh, whether it is operational or uh, or, or capex subsidies. Um, at least that's my impression on the on the situation now. I'm just coming back to the Q and A section again. If if any of the audience have an, an open question outside of those three sliders. Uh, I am keeping an eye here. Um, 
it was mentioned, I think, um, I think Paulo mentioned the, the importance in terms of introducing dedicated crops and getting that assessment right. Um, did you have any additional detail about what, what elements are quite critical to watch in terms of, so there's some questions here talking about potential opportunity to use underutilized land in Europe to grow biomass as a, a, a improvement on regional economy. Um, what kind of things, it, again, how do you define underutilized and what kind of key um, cautionary issues do we need to be keeping an eye on if we're looking at those as contributing to biomass supply? I might come in there, Mark, if that's okay. Yeah, please. Well, I suppose like if underutilized land um, is probably inherently either underproductive in terms of its fertility or it's not used for other reasons. If you try and maximize biomass production from it, you may require in certain circumstances significant use of fertilizers. So in terms of de like determining whether that crop is sustainable or not, like you would need full life cycle assessments or a very high level life cycle assessment at least to make sure that whatever increase in fertilizer consumption um, resulting in N2O emissions doesn't totally outweigh the use of burning that biomass or producing it into or turning it into a viable liquid or gaseous biofuel. I think being focusing only on the production of it is um, is a bit dangerous. You would have to consider the the greater impacts um, environmentally and I suppose economically as well on um, on the planet, bare just offsetting CO two emissions from combustion of it. Feel free, anyone else, to totally rubbish my suggestion. No, I look agree, agree, Richard, and that tends to be the the lens we're looking through in the Australian context where we're, the land that is seen as underutilized is actually underutilized for a fairly technical reason around water availability or nutrient availability and, and being able to overcome that even to grow a, a basic biomass product for energy. Others could, comes with its own compromises to make it work. So getting that balance between sustainability and, and economic supply is, is quite, um, quite a bit more challenging than simply saying, make use of underutilized land. Any other panelists with thoughts on that point? Okay, I'm, I'm conscious and, and given that I'm after midnight as compared to other time zones, I am conscious, Jim, that we've probably passed our time and the numbers are, are dropping off in the participants section. So I might draw a line in it there and uh, possibly give each of the, the panel members a, a last chance to make a final comment before we close. Yes, excellent. We've lost a few panel members that had to go, but uh, if there are any others that are still on the line, I see Yap and Richard, uh, please, and then please feel free to offer final comments. Was I go any first? Takers? I go sure. first and stick my head above the parapet and list it, it might be blown off. Um, I suppose my comments. And looking at my research and the work we do specifically, like identifying low value waste streams um, that are close to industrial energy users for the production of thermal energy might be kind of one of the initial steps to take. But I suppose, and it, this comes back to the point Mark was just making around, you know, underutilized land. There, sometimes there is, there are always consequences um, to using any form of energy. Um, nothing is totally clean. Um, and I suppose, it is up to each kind of individual industry, or maybe it's up to national policy, I don't know, but there needs to be a compromise drawn between the benefits in terms of greenhouse gas emission reductions versus the potential drawbacks. Um, increased land use, increased water consumption, N2O emissions from agricultural expansion, or the, in my case, the loss of animal feed. And I think being able to come up with some sort of cohesive way of balancing those positives and negatives I, I think will will allow for kind of a more targeted and a more nuanced approach when it comes to using bioenergy in industry.
Thank you, Richard. So, yep, uh, speaking um, um, to me, you know, to um, develop uh, biomass usage uh, in, in, in industry, um, we have um, to think long term. It's not a short term uh, project huh, to, uh, to implement uh, biomass boilers. And if we think long term, we need to full support from um, the top management. And we need the management, the top management to have uh, a vision on that. Um, even if um, we have an issue with the cost, for sure, right now. And the cost issue may be uh, compensated by, you know, subsidies. And it's also the, uh, the way an idea area and, to, and we have uh, support from uh, the local government. And that's why we have in France uh, with ADEM. That is a, uh, that is a uh, good way to, uh, to push and to, uh, to get uh, the incentive uh, to implement biomass boilers, for example. Yes, but what I would like to add uh, to that uh, as my final comment is that when we look at uh, the scale of application, uh, we compare it to other bioenergy uh, applications or uh, more, uh, more particularly bioheat applications. Uh, uh, pa Paolo Franco uh, mentioned uh, in, in, this, in his uh, in first presentation that we should get rid of the small scale combustion uh, uh, applications uh, in developing countries, for example which cause a lot of uh, pollution. Uh, and here we have a, a technology option with industrial bioenergy use that allows for, uh, for, for clean generation of the heat. Uh, we do have, uh, uh, due to economy of scale uh, aspects, we, can, we are able to invest in uh, the flue gas cleaning that allows for very low emissions. Uh, and this is, uh, this is something that uh, uh, if, if we introduce more and more bioenergy, uh, a big advantage, I think. So. Um, uh, by by the, the scale of application, we're able to um, invest in, uh, in in good equipment and also in professional operation of the of the boilers. So this is uh, an additional advantage that hasn't been mentioned yet, but which I, I think is relevant as well. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Mark, any closing comments for you? Uh, Look, I, th I think we've we've had a really great discussion and feedback reflects that in the, the chat section as people have had to to sign off. Um, I, I do see industrial heat as, as a strong opportunity for uh, biomass as, as the presentations highlight it from IA Secretariat about the role they play in carbon emissions and the ability of, of biomass to make a significant contribution to improving that. So. It's been really great to see the case studies and the discussion come through here and, and some reasonably good consensus around some of the challenges that still face that we can certainly uh, continue to explore in our IA bioenergy activity. So thanks to everybody and I'll leave it with you, Jim, to conclude. All right, thank you very much. And also wanna thank uh, Luke for handling the Slido that added a very nice interactive element to this and uh, was entertaining and interesting for all of us and made for greater participation. So thanks to all the panelists and thanks to all the participants for your questions and your interest. It may have been stated previously, but all the presentations will be made available afterwards. So you can look forward to that. We do have two more sessions in the next day. So we hope you can join us. And thanks also to our hosts, Chiara and Ernesto for engineering and uh, orchestrating this so well. So thank you all and have a good day or good evening, good morning, wherever you happen to be. And we hope you're with us the next time. Okay, bye now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.